Hey everyone, welcome back to Mr. Geopolitics. Today is September the 19th, and we're going to be talking about all the latest developments in Ukraine. So we're going to start off in the Kherson region, where the Ukrainian counteroffensive has pretty much stalled to a grind. Um, in the southern tip, uh, Alexandrivka, this map shows that basically the Ukrainians are in control, but um, from what I've heard, the Russians are actually in control of this settlement, and the Ukrainians have attempted to assault the settlement more than half a dozen times, and uh, so far they failed every time. Uh, the reason you see the blue and the red and then you see the white here because this is supposed to be the gray zone on this map. But I have heard reports recently that where the Russians have said that the, at Ternovi Podi, Ukrainian forces have been repelled. And I, and, uh, I heard that uh, two or three times uh, last week. So if, I mean, if the Ukrainians are being repelled from here, obviously they don't control it. But <clears throat> the issue with these settlements here is that if you zoom in on 90% of them, I mean, this settlement is basically a road. It's not even one mile by one mile. It's not even a mile squared, not even a kilometer squared. So it's basically a road. Some of them um, are just empty roads. Some of them have a few dozen houses, but um, they don't have, most of them don't have any strategic significance. And uh, I mean, these settlements can change hands day by day. They're just pretty much hamlets. They're little road stops. Um, in any case, uh, a week before the Kherson counteroffensive started, the Russians took all this territory. So all this, you see I've highlighted in the blue right here, this chunk. And uh, they didn't even really mention it. There wasn't, uh, you know, they didn't make a big deal out of it. And this happened all within 24 hours. Um, at the David Breed section, um, the main obstacle for the Ukrainians now is the, is the Ingulitz River. Um, basically, after the Russians struck a dam in Kriviri and two more dams to the north, there uh, was major flooding in Kriviri and the water level increased by two meters. And uh, the pontoon bridges the Ukrainians have established basically became useless. So the Ukrainian forces have been stranded here and their forces are more or less centered around Suki Stavok. And uh, I've said this before, but a trend has developed where the Ukrainians establish pontoon bridges, the Russians destroy the pontoon bridges, and then when the Ukrainians are stranded, they pound their positions relentlessly now, the Ukrainians recently, they've tried to uh, um, expand this little bridgehead. They call it the gut, actually. They're calling it the gut. They've tried to uh, fatten their gut, but they haven't had much success. The best thing the Ukrainians could do would be to take this settlement here, Brukinsk. They uh, were assaulting it a few weeks ago. They were on the outskirts, but they were repelled. But anyways, if they took this settlement, they would cut off the T-2207 this road, which connects to all the frontline settlements along the Ingolitz River, right? So, but they haven't been able to do that. Um, so they're basically, um, the offensive here is more or less stalled. The entire offensive is more or less stalled. I mean, the, the Ukrainians, the best success they've had is taking the Sukhopilia, but in between there's a gray zone. Um, there's fighting all along the front line. The Ukrainians, I believe, also took this settlement. Um, but like I've said before, these... Um, oh, this is a little better, a little bigger. Um, but um, it's a couple streets, I mean. But anyways, yeah, the Ukrainians are still trying to advance. Um, they're really relentless with how they're just keep, they keep sending more and more reinforcements, more and more troops, but um, it's very slow going. 
we haven't had that much success nothing compared to uh the Kharkiv region at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant the town of Enerhodar the Ukrainians and the Russians are exchanging uh, artillery fire and rockets and uh, at Nikopol the Russians have recently been uh, pounding Nikopol with Iranian drones the Shahid 136 and I read a report in the Wall Street Journal recently uh, in the la uh, last night where basically a Ukrainian commander stated that Iranian drones are having a devastating effect on Ukrainian forces. So these the kamikaze drones like the Shahid 136, they're pretty they're pretty large. They would take at least two people to carry it. The warhead is uh it's a pretty big warhead for a kamikaze drone and uh it's very destructive if you look up the footage on YouTube. The Shahid 136 and um anyways um you know what really bothers me people that think and actually wholeheartedly believe that the russians are pounding their own positions they're uh shelling their own soldiers and destroying their own equipment pounding their own positions in and around the zaporizhia nuclear power plant first of all this is the largest power plant in europe it's an asset so why would the Russians shell it? And why would they continue shelling it? And why would they continue shelling their own positions, their own soldiers? It just, you know, it defies logic. And if you really believe this, you need to slap yourself. You need a wake-up call because it just doesn't make any sense. Uh, right here, further east at the Zaporizhia area, um, these the, what you see in the blue is what the Russians actually control. Uh, they're actually outside of this settlement, Volodar. And um, the Russians were making strides to uh, what they were trying to do at one point was uh, expand this bulge and eventually reach um, this, this highway right here, the H-15, to cut off all these settlements here and stop some of the relentless shelling on Donetsk City because recently the Ukrainians have been shelling Donetsk City and oftentimes civilians get killed um, a lot of the times when this shelling occurs it's it's blatantly I mean it's obvious that it's they're targeting civilians it's sad but um, I'm not picking sides I'm saying both sides are responsible um, both sides have done uh, done things like this targeted areas where uh, predominantly there are civilians so but for the Russians essentially to to, to stop this from occurring they would have to take all these settlements on the front lines and they haven't had much success here because this area along um, near Donetsk City is very heavily entrenched some say it's the most um, entrenched area of the entire front. You can see since the start of the war, this red, dark red line, the front line hasn't changed much. The, Russian, the Russians haven't been able to take, uh, make, make many, if any, gains here. Um, now, if we go further to what they call the Zelensky line, we have Bakhmut, Soledar, Seversk. There's fighting all along the front line. Um, there are some reports that the Russians, there's heavy fighting along uh, and along the front line in Bakhmut, and the Russians are slowly but surely advancing. But uh, we have to just keep track. We keep watching and see what happens. Um, Bilohorivka, it seems that the Ukrainians have liberated Bilohorivka. And um, there's actually another settlement right here called Bilohorivka. So there's, there's been some confusion between the two, but it seems that um, it seems that this time the Ukrainians have indeed liberated Bilohorivka. Um, a few days ago they claimed that they liberated it, but the Russians it seems retained control. But now it seems the Ukrainians have um, have taken control over it. And uh, also today they took control over Yarova. So the bridgehead they've uh, established here to the west, where they've crossed the Seversky Donetsk River, 
and they took this settlement and now they've made their way to Yerova and they've taken Yerova. What I'm hearing is that they're still fighting on the outskirts. Um, so who knows, in the next 24 hours, 48 hours, uh, we don't know what's going to happen, but uh, we're just going to keep watching. But uh, in this, uh, along this entire front, uh, the Ukrainians, it seems like they want to establish a bridgehead here. And they want to do this before, um, before it starts raining really hard, because uh, the rainy season is upon us, and soon it's, gonna, it's going to start pouring rain so um, the Ukrainians if they want to make gains they have to do it now sooner than later and it seems like uh, it seems as if the master plan is um, to basically send troops from Yarova east southeast towards Leman over here they've crossed the Seversky Donets and uh, their main goal is Leman uh, another main goal is Yampil, settlement of Yampil, so Leman and Yampil. And now from the east, it seems like the Ukrainians also want to head west and establish a bridgehead, bridgehead here. The issue, the biggest issue with establishing a bridgehead here is that Ukrainian forces will be completely reliant on bridges for their supply lines because the Seversky Donetsk River runs all along here. And to get to the other side, the Ukrainians have to cross various bridges. And uh, the Russians haven't destroyed these bridges yet. They haven't targeted these bridges. But it doesn't mean they won't. I mean, they definitely can. But uh, basically, you know, if the Russians at any point decide to destroy these bridges, what will end up happening is that this entire bridgehead, the supply lines will be cut off and the Ukrainian forces here will be stranded. And after that, the Russians uh, might very well proceed to pound these positions and uh, with rockets, artillery, and they might launch a counterattack. And uh, it won't be a good situation for the troops that are stranded here. So again, the Russians haven't targeted the bridges yet, but it doesn't mean they won't. Uh, that's the biggest vulnerability with this bridgehead. But anyways, so far the, the Ukrainians seem determined, so we're gonna keep watching and uh, see what happens there. Now, at Sloviansk, at Sloviansk, the Russians have uh, allegedly, there was a missile strike uh, a Russian missile strike on a Kraken base. Kraken is a Ukrainian, um, they're similar to the Azov Battalion. Um, the Russians say they're neo-Nazis and that they've all been recruited from prison. And they're known for being ruthless. The, the, crap, the members of Kraken are known for, for killing Russian prisoners, not taking any prisoners, which goes against the Geneva Convention, but that's just what they do. Um, Anyways, so a Kraken base at Sloviansk has been struck and at Kramatorsk, the Russians have also allegedly struck an academy, academy with an I, base with missiles. Now, academy is actually Blackwater. Blackwater is a, is a U.S. Uh, mercenary group. They're paid to fight. So the Russians are claiming that they destroyed a Blackwater base here uh, in Kramatorsk. Now, the biggest question, which what I'm wondering is, are the Russians going to mobilize? Because it seems pretty obvious that uh, with things being as they are, the Russians are not, it's very unlikely that they're going to be able, that they're going to be able to meet their goals. So even for the Russians to take the Donetsk region, it seems very unlikely at this point with the thing, the way things are. 
the Russians, their biggest problem is manpower. So the biggest question, what I, which I'm wondering is, will the Russians mobilize? Because, I mean, they have 2 million reserves, but um, they don't really need to mobilize 2 million troops. I mean, all they would need is a quarter million. Because, I mean, Kharkiv, in the beginning of the war, when they attacked Kharkiv, they had 40,000 or so troops attacking Kharkiv. Um, you can imagine if they had twice as many troops or three times as many, they would have likely surrounded Kharkiv, right? Even Kiev, um, the Russians, when they attacked Kiev, they had around 40, 50,000 troops. And uh, they made it this far, you can see the, in the blue, they made it pretty far. I mean, if they had twice as many troops, they probably would have surrounded Kiev. So a quarter million troops um, and uh, would be enough probably to win this war. Half a million would just be overkill. It would be just, it would be, I would say the Ukrainians would uh, definitely lose this war if the, if, the, if, if the Russians were able to mobilize half a million. But the question is, will the Russians mobilize, um, especially after the Ukrainians took the Kharkiv region in just a few days, this whole bulge? Um, it has become apparent that the Russians are facing a manpower deficiency problem issue. Um, recently, I uploaded footage on my channel which shows how the head of um, the head of the uh, Wagner Group, the which who are Russian mercenaries, the head of the Wagner Group, how he's going to various prisons and uh, he's recruiting prisoners to fight. So. Yeah, that's the biggest issue for the Russians, um, for the Ukrainians. Um, there are various reports claiming that uh, they have sustained large numbers of casualties. Um, I mean, there's U there's U.S. Uh, NATO is not sending troops directly, but they're sending, you know, American mercenaries. Uh, there's reports that women are being recruited to fighting the Ukrainian army. So the Ukrainian army, their biggest issue is casualties. The Russians, the biggest issue for them is uh, manpower. But we're just going to keep watching and see how uh, the situation develops. Anyways, guys, thank you for watching again. And uh, please like and subscribe, comment and share. And uh, I will see you in the next one.